Hello, this is John Owings. I'm here at South Harriman Baptist Church, and we're taping the Sunday School lesson for this coming Sunday, February 21. And the title of the lesson is Loved. Probably a lesson that we should have had last Sunday since it was Valentine's Day. Um, but this lesson is really more than just about love. The, um, the lesson really focuses on faith. Jesus saves all who come to him in faith. And so that's what we're going to study today. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity of studying your word. Thank you for the opportunity of spreading the gospel. We praise you and we ask you to be with us during this lesson and that it may fall on receiving ears. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. So we're in the book of Luke. We're in chapter 7, and the focus today, uh, according to the quarterly, is verses 40 through 50. Chapter 7, verses 40 through 50. And so the focus is on Jesus coming into the home of uh, Simon. Simon was hosting him, and there was an interaction there with a lady who um, took an interest in Jesus. She loved Jesus. And through her faith, she was saved that day. The lesson to me is really all about faith and the reading actually for the lesson starts in the chapter chapter 7 of Luke starts with verse 1 and it goes all the way through chapter 8 verse 56 so it's two full chapters and we're going to cover parts of those two chapters so the first thoughts are these that most of us have been given a second chance here and there. I've been given my share of second and third chances. So whenever we made a big mistake, there was a person in our lives that was willing to see past that mistake and to help us move forward. That individual's offer of forgiveness assistance in moving forward and an opportunity to prove ourselves caused us to appreciate and love that person in a deeper way. Similarly, we should respond to Christ's forgiveness by loving Him in return. Chapter 7, verse 1 through 856, just kind of a preview. Um, you know, great mercy begets great love. So this theme not only characterizes the core of, of this week's study, it also colors the various incidents that leads up to the dinner with Simon that I just mentioned. That's going to be found in verses 40 through 48 or 9 of Chapter 7, healing the sick, we're going to hear about that. Raising the dead, they bookend these passages. These miracles not only demonstrated Jesus' power, but it revealed His compassionate love. So following the Sermon on the Plain, which you probably heard about last week. Jesus returned to Capernaum 
he was there approached by some Jewish elders on behalf of a Roman centurion whose servant was deathly sick. The soldier's humble faith touched Jesus. Jesus healed the man's servant. Soon afterward, Jesus traveled to Nain. It's spelled N-A-I-N, pronounced Nain, which is about 25 miles southwest of Capernaum. He entered the town and he encountered a funeral procession, procession for a young man who was the only son of a widow. Again, Jesus' compassionate love led him to intervene. He touched the open coffin. He called on the young man to rise. When the man sat up and began to speak, everyone responded by glorifying God and spreading the news about Jesus. At the end of this context passage, near the end in chapter 8, Jesus was involved in another scene of healing and raising the dead. He was approached by Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. Jairus begged Jesus to help his young daughter who was dying. I believe she was 12 years old. On the way, Jesus encountered a woman with a serious illness. As she touched the hem of his garment, she was healed. And Jesus remarked about her faith. And we'll see from the passage, he said, Who touched, who touched my garment? Who touched me? And this lady, uh, somewhat reluctantly, came to the front and there was a huge crowd and she said, I did. And we'll see what Jesus said to her later on. Although this girl that he was going to see, um, Jairus' daughter, she died before Jesus could get there. Jesus continued on to the home, but then he raised this child to life. So between these events, those are the bookends, between those events, Jesus traveled from town to town, teaching the people in parables, which included the parable of the sower. This parable of the sower, it emphasized the importance of loving people enough to sow the gospel seed. Another story involved Jesus' parable at the home of Simon the Pharisee. This teaching was predicated by the loving response of a woman to God's merciful love and forgiveness. There's other occurrences that are included um, that have been unusual challenges to Jesus' ministry. And we'll, we'll read where John the Baptist somewhat questioned Jesus and what Jesus had to say about that. Jesus' family also came to see him. Um, they were concerned about what they had been hearing about Jesus' travels. Well, in both situations, Jesus pointed to his actions of merciful love and the faith response of the people who believed. It's all about faith. So let's start by, by um, just kind of covering, um, in a nutshell, we're going to cover some of these verses, starting with chapter 7. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to chapter 7 in Luke, starting with verse 1. And we're going to kind of work our way through these. So Jesus... He was, there was a certain centurion 
who was an officer of the Roman army, and he was also a Gentile. Um, the centurion's servant, who was dear to him, as, the, uh, as Luke tells us, was sick and he was ready to die. Verse 3, And when he heard of Jesus, that's better translated, and when he, when he had heard about Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, and they beseeched him that he would come and heal his servant. So, evidently this Gentile was, was sick of the, the centurion. He was sick of the pagan ways of Rome. And he had become very interested in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus knew that. So Jesus went with these persons but on his way there the centurion uh, Luke says he sent friends out to him and what we learn in Matthew is that the centurion also followed this crowd and would have spoken these very same words so in verse 6 the centurion, the crowd first, and then the centurion, I believe, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. So not knowing exactly what the Jews had, had told the Lord, he wanted Christ to know exactly who he was. He was a Gentile, which carried with it many connotations. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto you, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. So he's saying to Jesus, say in a word, and my servant will be healed. That proclaims a level of faith seldom, if ever, equaled by anyone in the Bible, at least of this nature. Faith. The faith, the faith of the centurion, of the Roman officer. <clears throat> when Jesus heard all of these things, down in verse 9, he marveled at them and he turned him about and he said unto the people that followed him those that followed Jesus I say unto you I have not found so great faith no not in Israel so all of this tells us that um, it's really only unbelief or faith with all of their attendant results both negative and positive that are the occasion in the eyes of God for astonishment. You know, there was, a, there was another instance when Jesus marveled, and that was found, that can be found in Mark 6, 6. And so Jesus marveled then, and that was negative. And Jesus marveled here, and it was Positive. Jesus marveled at the unbelief of those in Mark. And here he marveled at the faith, at the belief of the centurion. And so, and they who were sent, the returning to the house, found the servant whole. The servant that had been sick, he was healed. Well, next... Jesus um, encountered a dead man, the only son of his mother, and we mentioned that in the preamble here, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And many people of the city were with her, and they were carrying this young son 
to his grave. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said unto her, Weep not. We're now at chapter 7, verse 14. And he came and he touched the coffin. Now, in the, in the Bible says the bier. Um, it refers to a wooden frame. All right, that's the wooden frame, but it was the casket. Under Mosaic law, it's interesting that you were forbidden from touching anything pertaining to death. But that didn't apply to Jesus. So they, Jesus touched the coffin and they who bear him stood still. So in his presence, everything must stop including death. And he said, Young man, I say unto you, so he presents his deity, Arise. He speaks of his resurrection power, which will be used shortly to raise all of the sainted dead. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he who was dead, the young man, sat up and began to speak and he delivered him to his mother and they came a fear on all and they glorified God saying that a great prophet is risen up among us well, in that they were correct but only partially he was God and therefore their Messiah but they didn't understand that and that God has visited his people. So that proclaims the truth, but in far greater de degree than they were imagining. And this rumor of him went forth through all Judea and throughout all of the region. So who was this person? Who was this Messiah? Then we have the encounter from John the Baptist. John called unto him, unto himself, John was in prison at the time, two of his disciples, um, he sent them to Jesus saying, Are you he who should come or look we for another? So there was some doubt. So at time, at times, faith wavers, doesn't it? It can. And it even did with John the Baptist. So even in the strongest, as evidenced here by John, faith may waver. It is only the master who never turns aside from the path of right. Quite possibly, John the Baptist was puzzled. If Jesus truly was the Messiah, why didn't he deliver him from the prison? Well, when the men were come to him unto Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to come unto you, saying, Are you he who should come, or look we for another? But Jesus did not criticize John the Baptist. Jesus' answer starts in verse 21. And in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many who were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things you have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. So that was the message. They said, go give this to John. Jesus said, go give this message to John. So then Jesus spoke about John the Baptist. And he, he didn't want the messengers or anyone else there to feel like that 
he was at all upset by John's waver of faith. And in fact, we find in verse 28, Jesus led up to this, but in find in verse 28, Jesus said, For I say unto you, among those who are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Um, so all the prophets before had said that Jesus was coming. John said in John 1, 29, he said, Behold, he is here. So Jesus um, was not at all concerned with John's waver of faith and in fact sent him a positive message and left him in a positive light with all of us and with those there that day. Now we get to the core of the lesson today and the title being loved but the message really is Jesus saves all who come to him in faith. So now Jesus and the woman starting with verse 36 and one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And so he went into the Pharisee's house and he sat down to eat and behold a woman in the city when she knew that Jesus sat at uh, the table to eat in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet. She washed his feet with her tears. These were tears of sorrow and of joy. Sorrow because of her sins. It was said that she had been a prostitute. And joy because this was the one who could forgive those sins. And in fact, we learn, did. She did wipe her tears with the hairs of her head, and she kissed his feet. And she anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, which had asked him to come and eat with him, spoke, he spoke within himself. And so he didn't speak these words out loud, but he was thinking this, that this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is who touches him, for she is a sinner. Well, this man... By, by thinking that, he was judging both Jesus and the woman. He was wrong on both counts. While she was a sinner, the Pharisee was, in fact, a greater sinner. Verse 40, And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, Master, say on. Well, that was pretty sarcastic, wasn't it? Therefore, you know, he expects the words of wisdom he's going to receive, um, but it's, it's laced with sarcasm. He's already revealed the unbelief of the heart by using the words, this man, if he were a prophet. So he has disbelief. Well, then Jesus goes through and starting in, in verse 41, and this is, like I say, at the core of our lesson today. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence, the other 50. 500 pence was, well, one pence was a day's wage. And so 500, it's almost two years worth of wages. And the 50, it's almost two months worth of wages. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose. So he kind of gave himself 
some flexibility there. I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Jesus said unto him, You have rightly judged. So Jesus was appealing to this man on his, at his own level. And Jesus turned to the woman then. And this was really the first instance when you read through this passage that Jesus acknowledged the woman in any way. And he said unto Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered into your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she, was, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. You gave me no kiss, as was customary in those days. But this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. Simon would not kiss the face of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit had the woman to kiss the feet of Jesus, which really denotes Jesus' authority and power and rule. My head with oil you did not anoint. That was another custom of the day. So Simon, he said, Jesus, come and have dinner with me, but he didn't make a special place at his table for him, and he should have. That was an insult. He didn't wash his feet. Back in that day, everything was dusty, and that was customary. You washed the feet, and you anointed with oil. You made a special place at the table and you kiss the person on the cheek. He did none of those things. And this woman, whom they did not know, came in and did all of those things, and she did those with her tears and her hair and the ointment that she brought with her. So Jesus then says in verse 47, Wherefore I say unto you, her sins which are many are forgiven for she loved much but to whom little is forgiven the same loves little so every believer must realize that he has been forgiven much And if we realize that we have been forgiven much, we will love much. And Jesus said unto her, Your sins are forgiven. That's verse 48. Verse 49, And they, they who sat at the table with him began to say within themselves, who is this who forgives sins? So his act of forgiving this woman, it should have told him who in fact he was. Um, it should have told him that he was the Messiah. And he said to the woman, Jesus then said to the woman, and this is the key to the lesson today, your faith has saved you. Jesus didn't say to the woman that your love has saved you. He didn't say your tears have saved you, but your faith has saved you. And he said, go in peace. That is the core of the lesson today. Your faith will save you. We've got to have love. 
and we're going to have some tears. But it's faith that saves us. It's faith that saved this woman when she sat with Jesus. Chapter 8. We're going to go through this rather quickly. Chapter 8. It starts with preaching the gospel. And it says, And came to pass afterward that he, he went, Jesus went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. So the disciples were with him. And certain women, women are, by the way, prominently mentioned in Luke. And it's noted, it was not a woman who sold the Lord for 30 pieces of silver, was it? It was not a woman who forsook him and fled, was it? It was women who were the first to visit his tomb on the resurrection morning. So, and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, and Susanna and many others which ministered unto him in their substance. So they were with him as well. And then we have the, power, the parable of the sower. And I'll let you read that uh, for yourselves. The seed is the word of God, of course, that they talk about in here. Um, but it's all about spreading the gospel seed. Well, then there is a section which talks about um, a candle. And there's some reference there and some true relatives. That's when his family came to him. And let's read that, chapter 8, verse 19. Then came to him his mother and his brethren and could not come at him for the press. The crowd was so large that his family couldn't get to him. And it was told to Jesus by certain which said, Your mother and your brethren stand without. They want to come and see you. And Jesus answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. There he was plainly proclaiming allegiance to God. It's even more solemn than family ties. That, by the way, refutes the Catholic contention that Mary is above all. Then there was the storm. And we've all heard about the storm from, from days gone by and, and, you know, from our youngest days in Sunday school. Um, we heard about the storm and the, the doubting of the disciples that were on the boat with Jesus. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. So from the western shore of the Galilee to the eastern shore. And so they, they launched and started making their journey. But as they, as they sailed, Jesus fell asleep. And then there came this storm. This storm of wind on the lake. And they started to get filled with water. And they were in jeopardy of sinking. And they came to Jesus. They were afraid. And they, they woke him up and they said, Master, Master, we perish. Then Jesus arose and he rebuked the wind and the raging water. That really refers to an evil spirit behind the storm 
that was attempting to kill the disciples. Satan knew that Jesus could not be killed, but he also knew the disciples could be very mortal. Well, then the, the winds and the raging water, it ceased and there was calm. It was immediate. It was instant. And Jesus said unto him, unto them, Where is your, what? Verse 25, And he said unto them, Where is your faith? Christ is the answer concerning all of the storms of life. And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commands even the winds and water, and they obey him. And last, flip over to the last section or so of, of this reading. And let's start with... Verse 44, chapter 8, verse 44. So you had a woman that, this is, um, you had a woman that was ill. And this is when Jesus, he had returned to Capernaum. And there was a man named Jairus. And he was a ruler of the synagogue. And his daughter had become ill, and she was 12 years of age, and she lay dying. But as Jesus went toward the house of Jairus, the people, they thronged him, so says Luke. And Jesus, starting in verse 44, came behind him and there were the, before he got to the house, before he got to the house, there was a woman having an issue of blood, 12 years, probably referred to a female disorder, which had spent all of her living upon physicians and neither could be healed of any of her issues. And she came from behind him and she touched his garment and immediately her issue of blood was cured and Jesus said who touched me in fact there were a whole lot of folks that were touching Jesus but none with the faith that this woman had when all denied um, Peter and, and they who were with him said, Master, the multitude throng you and press you, and you say, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody has touched me, for I perceive that virtue, that power, is gone out of me. Jesus didn't touch the woman. She touched him. This tells us that if the Lord doesn't touch us, we can still touch him and receive that which we need. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, so she was evidently trying to hide, right? She came trembling. And it startled her that Jesus would stop, in essence, calling for her, especially considering the great throng of people that were there. And she fell down before him, and she declared unto Jesus before all the people, for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, so she was no longer a woman, she was daughter. Be of good comfort. Your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. And while yet he spoke, uh, there came one from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, to Jairus, Your daughter is dead, trouble not the master, 
But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, Fear not. Believe only, and she shall be made whole. That's the only requirement. The only requirement is faith in Christ. Believe. Believe only. And she will be made whole. Well, they went to the house. And Jesus went to the house. And it says, He suffered no man to go in and save Peter, James, and John and the father and the mother of the young girl. So this was also the first time that those three disciples had been singled out. And they all went, and then those went in and all wept and bewailed her. And that represents there were paid mourners there. And Jesus said, Weep not, she's not dead, but asleep. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. And verse 54 says, And he put them all out. So Jesus, the, the Greek text to that proclaims the fact that it must have been very close to a forceful ejection as in the case of the cleansing of the temple, for instance. So he put them all out, all these paid mourners, which was custom in those days. And he took her by the hand, and he called, saying, Maid, arise. And the Spirit came again, and her spirit, her spirit, and her spirit came again. Verse 55. Now that demonstrates the separate existence of the spirit as independent of the body. Her spirit and soul were once again reunited with her body, with the body instantly coming alive. And she arose straightway, immediately. And he commanded to give her food. And her parents were astonished. But he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. Jesus sought neither publicity nor admiration. But how many times did... I just mentioned faith in those two chapters. Jesus saves all who come to him in faith. So like this lady that was at the dinner table with Simon and Jesus and some others. It doesn't describe who they were. No longer, because she had faith, no longer would she be bound by the shame of her sin. She could set aside her inner turmoil that she had experienced for so many years. She could be at peace and move forward with her life. Forgiveness is found in Christ and Christ alone. The woman's faith paved the way for Christ's forgiveness. That's the lesson today.
as I always like to do, I like to end with a song. And or begin, or both. And today we're going to end with one. And there was a song that was suggested by the um, writers of the quarterly. And it is, it's an old hymn that uh, most of you will know. It is, Have Faith in God. It was written by B.B. McKinney. And it, it supports the theme of this session, which is Jesus saves all who come to Him in faith. So have faith in God. And I just wanted to read some of the passages from that song. Um, have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all the way you have trod. Never alone are the least of His children. You know, Romans 8 says, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And we're going to hear that in this song today. Never alone are the least of His children. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. The second verse, have faith in God. When your prayers are unanswered, your earnest plea, He will never forget. Wait on the Lord, trust His Word, and be patient. Have faith in God. He'll answer yet. He'll answer yet. Have faith in God in your pain and your sorrow. His heart is touched with your grief and despair. Cast all your cares and your burdens upon Him and leave them there. Oh, leave them there. Have faith in God, though all else fail about you. Have faith in God. He provides for His own. He cannot fail, though all kingdoms shall perish. He rules he reigns upon His throne. And the refrain is, Have faith in God. He's on His throne. Have faith in God. He watches o'er His own. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Father, we thank You for the opportunity to raise you up, to look up at you and see your loving kindness, the opportunity to spread your word. And Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the examples of faith and of the opportunity that we each have to spread your word across all nations. Have faith in God as the song explains is all about you, Lord, and we have faith in you. And we ask these things, and we say these things, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sam's going to play um, a, a version of Have Faith in God. It is, it is one that's sung by a congregation in Oklahoma, I believe it is.
but it reminds me of the days when we could worship in church and singing the old hymns. And this was certainly a service that was pre-COVID. <laughs> uh, and it, it is, uh, I think, an example of days that will be again. Um, and it is certainly a song of hope and um, of days gone by that it was a, it's a beautiful thing actually to watch and to listen to this congregation sing this song and you can imagine yourself right there with the congregation singing along with it um, and we'll have that again one of these days and um, I know God's going to that's going to happen in God's time for now, uh, thank you for listening in, and Sam's going to play the song. Take care. Wonderful hymn, Have Faith in God, number 424. We'll sing all four verses tonight. Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. On that first verse, number 424. Have faith in God. verse of this. Look at the words with me. Have faith in God, though all else fail about you. Have faith in God. He provides for his own. Romans 8 says, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Let's lift it up on that last verse together when we get to that chorus. Just sing it out to our Lord tonight. He's waiting to hear our praise. Let's sing it on that last verse all together now. Have faith in God. be seated.